It's me here, Phil Collins. Do you remember me? I didn't come from any any musical. There was no music in our family at all. It just so happened that I was given a drum when I was three. My uncles made me a drum kit when I was five because I showed a lot of interest in this drum when I was three. And music from that point on was the only thing I wanted to do. From the age of five, I never wanted to be anything else. That's why my uncles had made me this drum kit. You know? And I never wanted to be a train driver or a racing driver or an astronaut. You know, I never wanted to be anything else. I just wanted to be a drummer. And, uh, and that's really what I've been all my life, you know. And I've just, I've, I've, I've just gone out from that position and just visited other places, like singing, like songwriting. And obviously, as, as you do this, some of those things become more important than just visiting. But um, nevertheless, I still see it as that I live behind the drums and I visit other places. I never go anywhere without my three film crews. <laughs> Well, it didn't occur to me at all that, that it was six years since the last Phil Collins record. And people were saying that. They said, well, this is your first album for six years. I said, wait a second, no, no, no. Tarzan, big band, you know. And they said, well, that doesn't count. Well, well, to me it counts because I'm just carrying on working and doing things. But um, I started to see the positive side of it, actually, that, that, that six years, first album six years, maybe it'd be, it's an opportunity for people to say, I wonder, what, I wonder what he's doing now. I wonder what, if there's any difference. I wonder if there's a change. This is your wake-up call. You're gonna miss it all. I can't really, really say, say there's something that's, that's uh, so profound that it's going to sum it up. I mean, it's still me, but it's just me in, in a kind of, in a different way, I think. I mean, I'm just talking about, from the moment the wake-up call starts, it's very different for me. I hear that and think, I've never done that. I never even, never sound like that before. There's lots of, of just new touches in there. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you were to take skim the songs down to just me and a piano, maybe some of them aren't that far away in style from what I was doing before. But the way, with the aid of, you know, the kind of the way I was working and trying this, trying that, and oh, that's better. That, that isn't, but that's, that's better. Um, then I think it's, it's kind of a new me. The album was written over a couple of years, period, you know, I suppose. I was on tour with both sides, and I took with me a keyboard, a sequencer, and I did a lot of writing, uh, little bits, loads of little bits, 16 bar bits, 32 bits, just bits on this keyboard and, you know, saved it onto disc and um, didn't know what to do with it. And then, you know, I did Tarzan and then they asked me to do, Disney asked me to do another film and at that point I thought, well, I better go in, I better get stuck into this computer world because the way film music is that they will always ask you to do it shorter or just to hear it. Can we hear it shorter? Can we hear it faster? Can we hear it without that verse? Can we get it, can you condense it, speed it up three seconds, you know? So I thought now was the time to, to get my feet wet with the computer. With the computers, obviously, I was able to do far more finished things than I've ever done before. And one of the things we did was transfer these bits that I wrote in 94. And they became Wake Up Call, Testify, It's Not Too Late, you know. A few of those bits developed into songs. I was working with Rob Cavallo on I Can't Stop Loving You and Least You Can Do. And uh, I played him the demos and I said, uh, just want you to, just want to like get your feedback on this because I've been given the strong impressions that maybe I should get a producer in to sort of change all this and bring it into the, the 21st century, you know. And he came back the next day and he said, guys, listen to this. And he put Wake Up Call and he said, this is great, man. You don't want to do anything to this apart from maybe do this, a little bit of guitar, a little bit of real drums maybe. And I said, we, thank you, thank you, God, this man gets it. Do you want to do the album? You know, and he said, I'd love to do the album. 
So I found my producer because he understood what I wanted to do and that was the most important thing. You know, the, it's, it's important in a way to understand the way I, I write because, you know, I don't, I, I don't sit down and say, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a love song. For Orient, you know, I don't, I don't sit down and write it. I had the, I had the music, or what is, what is, gradually becoming a song. And I just, because I'm on my own, I work on my own. I don't have anybody hanging around, you know, operating equipment. I do all that myself. So I just on my own in my studio, and I push play and record, and I sing. And what you hear lyrically is what I sing. I mean, sometimes a whole verse, a whole chorus, the whole song comes out. In the air tonight, it was totally improvised, way back. And I thought, well, that's an interesting way to do it. Boy, I must have all that emotion inside me, but I mean, it, it came out. And so I've always written like that. You know, sometimes you get songs that are really stubborn and you have to sit down and say, okay, I've got one line. I've got to write the rest. Other times you have a whole verse, whole chorus. Something will suggest the, the mood of the music or just because you're you let your subconscious run free, um, it will write itself and testify. You know, I, I wrote those lyrics just, I, I didn't write them, I just sang them, you know. And it was obvious what it was about, but I didn't actually physically sit down and, and sort of say, I'm going to write this, which kind of makes it stronger in a way because it means it, it is inside you and it comes out. Every heart that's ever been broken I'm very, very happy. I've got a you know, great family life. Um, my kids are getting older. I've got four kids and a little Nicholas, who is uh, absolutely wonderful. And uh, I've got Lily, who's 13, Jolie, 30 now, believe it or not, and Simon, who's 25, 26 in two days. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lovely place to be, actually. I mean, I'm quite happy to be me at my time of life in the place I live with the person I love. So it's a, and it does reflect in the music, yeah. There's some very optimistic songs, very happy songs, which is, you know, not what people kind of expect from me. Well, I can feel it coming in the air, I know. Ooh, Lord. My albums have always been uh, pretty autobiographical to a larger extent. In 1994, I was on tour with both sides, and as it happened, I was, you know, stuck in hotel rooms for a lot of that tour because of the tabloid frenzy. Basically, I'd, I'd gone against what people thought was, 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 was me, the perfect, you know, the perfect nice guy, family man. And, um, you know, my marriage was breaking up and I'd gone off with somebody else. And worst of all, I'd, I'd faxed for divorce, you know, which was a lot of rubbish. You know, this didn't happen. It was hairy. I mean, Oriane's father and grandfather were dying of cancer, and we had journalists in their back garden trying to sort of get interviews about. And she just wanted, she just met me and fell in love with me and me with her. And she didn't know all this stuff existed. It was just, she was just happy. And yet, I mean, unhappy about her father and grandfather. And yet, you know, suddenly all these people were asking all these questions and, and, and intruding into their lives. And, uh, you know, Jill and, and Lily in England. Uh, you know, they were besieging her school, they were camping out in the, in the garden at the house in England. And so, um, it was just unpleasant for everybody. And uh, in the end, I just kind of felt, well, you know, if this is really, if this is where I've arrived at after this much time, then really I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. At the end of the Both Sides tour, I took six months off and built a home with Oriane in Switzerland. I mean, I went out every day to Geneva to buy knives and forks and tablecloths and, and sheets and towels. I didn't have anything, you know. And eventually, it all settled down and to the, to the point now where her and I go out walking out in London and nobody gives a toss, you know. I mean, photographers take photographs of somebody else and that's fine by me. Well, I remember, I remember
Los Angeles is where I tend to spend more time than anywhere else in the States. I mean, Disney are here. And so for the last six years, I've been coming here every month for a, for a week or every couple of months for 10 days or so to work on Tarzan, the new Disney film that I'm doing and various other things. And also because my daughter Lily, uh, she lives here in Los Angeles. And my daughter, Jolie, uh, my oldest daughter, she lives in Vancouver. So we're all on the same coast. So it's an opportunity to, for family get-togethers. for this Toyota gig uh, quite hard so and it's frustrating because you can't really you want to rehearse more but you know your voice can't do it you know I mean my voice held up very very well actually we did the whole show twice every day and that's kind of a lot to demand of a voice that hasn't actually been singing and got got um, you know strong uh, it just got strong stronger throughout the rehearsal days but it's been busy I have to say, it's been busy, but, uh, you know, the, the alternative of not doing it is, is not really on the cards because I want, I want to help the album as much as I can. I Can't Stop Loving You is, is, is the cover on the album, the cover song. Leo Sayer recorded it, Billy Nichols wrote it. I heard it, you know, just by accident in a... I was up at doing some skiing in Switzerland and I you know, was in the health club part of the hotel and they, they came on the speakers and I thought, oh, I remember that. Well, that's a good song. I'm sure uh, Leo Say will be a little thrilled because, you know, when you do a cover version, the original version starts to get played again as well, just so people can sort of hear where it started life. You know. but it's a good song. I'm looking at New York, and Tokyo is behind me. What a funny world we live in. Can I get the uh, 10 mil over here? Um, yeah, David. Yeah, right over here, guys. Then the choice is made as a single. There's the obvious thing about making a video, and I always find that is that's become a bit of a, a, a chore in as much as trying to find an idea that fits the song. You know, in the old days, it used to be a little bit more. It used to be easier. Um, I'd just come up with some comic idea and it would work, you know, and it would, it would stick out against all the conceptual ideas and girls with nothing on, you know. We never did that in videos with Genesis or me, really. We just took the funny idea and ran with it. Um, so I had to read a few concepts, and the one that appealed to me most was by Cameron Casey, and, and it was really that music, my music in, in this instance, was kind of just how much it goes around the world, you know. It influences people from every different culture. And uh, the way he described it, sort of, you know, going into people's headphones and then coming out and you're in another country with someone holding a Walkman or something. Uh, get a blast, you know. And kind of that, that idea appealed to me of all the ideas that I read. And, um, and we, you know, it was very difficult to shoot because it had to be, you know, all these different countries around the world and it was impossible to go there. So, um, but I left that to him to work out. And we, we shot it on the Paramount Studios lot and dress the sets so that they look like the countries. And, and uh, as we sit here right now, I haven't seen the finished product, you know. But I felt good on the night, uh, about on well, the day about it. I mean, it was a long day, but it was, uh, I think it'll turn out okay. Like
Uh, Drive Me Crazy is a song about the little demons that are inside all of us. The little devil that, as soon as you say something, he says, <laughs> the little gremlin, you know. He says, I share your darkest thoughts, but I don't share the consequences for them. You know, I'll make you do this, and I'll, have, I'll, have, I'll enjoy watching you do it, but don't blame me, it's you doing it, you know. When you're writing some of these things, you think, I could see this, I could see this on the radio, you know, I, could, I, could, I could imagine this. And all the songs that I can imagine, no one's mentioned it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I live, in, I live in Switzerland, I write my music in a nice place, and, uh, and, I, and it gets thrown out into this, this very uh, busy uh, hive of activity. And, I, you know, so therefore I, I take advice on what people think would be the best flagship for the record, you know. This song could could can be played on radio. This song can't be played on radio. Okay. Well, in my day, a good song was played on the radio. A bad one wasn't. You know what I mean? And I kind of, I still, I, I, I find myself rebelling and sort of resisting this. There's all these changes that have happened, which I don't think are for the better. You know. I mean, when I first came to America with Genesis, you know, in 1485. Um, we used to go to radio stations and they say, bring some of your own records along. Bring some records that you want to play. And I would go down there with my albums and I would put, I'd, not my albums, but I mean records I liked. You know, I'd play Frank Zappa for like 15 minutes. Then I'd play a bit of this, I'd play a bit of that. And we'd chat. And they'd say, I've got to go now, I've got to go to soundcheck. Really? Oh, that's a shame, you know. But now it's like in, bang, you talk to someone with a suit and tie, and then, they, and then you go. Sorry, I know you're going to leave. I haven't got to leave. Yes, you have. You know, and it's just a different world now. You, you me crazy. Me, I'm out of my mind. You, I won't, I shouldn't, and I can't write a song that fits into this, you know, I write what I write. And um, the best song, maybe for me, is a song that is totally impractical for a radio station, you know. So I have to take advice. And, uh, and if they come up, come back with the, 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 the easy way out, which I consider the easy way out, like the Phil Collins ballad, I think, oh, really? That means everybody that hears this for the first time will think, it's another Phil Collins album with another Phil Collins ballad, you know, as opposed to some of the the fresher sounding stuff. So any of those songs on that record, I love. I mean, they're all there because it's my it's my record, and I wouldn't put anything on that I didn't didn't like or didn't feel you know feel were great representations of what I write. But but I would just wish sometimes that people would go, that they'd be a bit more adventurous. But then they're handcuffed by the formats, by the radio formats. The reason I'm, I kind of decided not to tour was um, thrust upon me in some respects, but I'm not unhappy about it. I mean, I, two years ago I was recording Can't Stop Loving You, The Least You Can Do. During that week of recording, at the end of it, I, um, I lost a lot of hearing in this ear, 
and I thought it would come back. It was like water in your ear, you know. I kept thinking, oh, it'd be, be, be all right later, and it, and it wasn't. It's one of those unfortunate things. It hits people at random, suddenly, and it's nothing to do with age, music, loudness. It's an inner ear viral infection that eats the, the cells on the nerve to the brain. And if you're lucky, those cells regenerate, and if you're not, they don't. And so far, I've been unlucky. It's not a problem at all day-to-day -day life unless I'm in a, a noisy environment where I can't quite pick out conversations uh, with this ear, you know. I tend to sort of be like my mother. So what's that you say? The last guy I saw gave me a two test, an audiogram, which is like just a... Uh, but also a, a comprehension test, like say the word hot dog. You know. And this ear came out, you know, winning, you know, honours. This year, it was like, <laughs> and he said, well, that's the problem. That's your problem, is that you've got 32% comprehension. And that's why I can't give you a hearing aid, because you just amplify a crappy sound. You know? I asked him, what about going on tour and things like this? What would you say? And he said, well, I would suggest you don't. You don't need to, um, and you could run the risk of doing more damage to your ear. And if the other one goes out, you're going to be messed up completely. So I kind of took his advice, you know, because I've got, a new, I've got a, you know, a new son, I've got um, new opportunities to do things which mean I can write at home. And all I've got to do, the only hardship is I don't have to go and live in hotels for the next two or three years on tour. To me, there's no contest, you know. seriousness, I'm quite adjusted to the fact that my my golden period, you know, the 80s and 90s, has tailed off now, you know, and I'm doing other things, you know, I mean, I'm doing things outside that, that marketplace, which I don't really think I fit into anyway anymore. Um, the next, you know, the, the long term, I've got to be very involved with this Tarzan musical um, and writing the songs for it and, and, and keeping an eye on the adaptation of the songs in the musical theatre kind of environment. That's, that's professionally, I mean, on a personal level, I'm, you know, I'm going to watch my son grow up and I'm going to, with Orianne, we're probably going to have more children. And, uh, you know, just keep on enjoying life, you know, that's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's like the, this door opens to another, another world, this film music, and, and so now I'm going to go in and explore that world. After having explored it for a few years, I may come back out and go into the other door, you know, which is making another record for me or, or taking the big band out again. Maybe doing a bit more acting, I don't know. You know it's, um, I won't ever do things that I don't want to do and I won't ever do things that are going to intrude on my, on my real life. You know, um, I've, my real life is the most important thing. But fortunately, the things that I'm being asked to do fit quite well with my real life because I can write music at home. You know, the big, the big thing to take out of the picture is the touring. That is a big dent in your life, you know. I mean, a world tour is two years, and that's what I would end up doing if I did a, a tour. I 
I'm driven in as much as I love what I do. You know, that's the only drive. It's actually, can I do this? Yeah, how exciting. I'm being asked to do this. It literally is that. There's no, you know, it's not ambition. It's, not, it's certainly not blind ambition. It's, it's not being driven and sort of, you know, I, I lie awake at night, oh, I need to work, I need to work, you know. It's not like that either. It's just being asked to do great things, see if I can do them, and still, but still keep, keep the prioritizing that, that real life, my life now is very important to me, and my family's life, you know. And even if Jolie or Simon or Lily can say, ring me up and say, I'm gonna be coming through Europe in two weeks. Are you gonna be there? I say, yeah, as opposed to, ah, I'm in Tokyo. What a shame. Jesus.